Attack aviation is employed to neutralize and destroy objectives which are vulnerable to machine gun fire, light bombs, and chemicals. Important considerations in the selection of a suitable target are, first, its tactical importance in the commander's plan of action, then its vulnerability, its distance from the attacker's airdromes, the chances for affecting surprise, and the non-availability of other means to execute the mission. If adequate information on which to plan the attack is lacking, this is obtained by timely air reconnaissance. In the execution of its mission, attack aviation endeavors to cover the target with an effective density of fire and chemicals. To this end, successive attacks may be necessary. The element of surprise will, however, be sacrificed in such repetitions of the attack. Upon completion of the attack, a reconnaissance should be made, if practicable, to check its results. The foregoing principles and the methods applied in the conduct of the attack will be illustrated in this film by the employment of a group of two squadrons in an attack on a hostile airdrome. From York, a line following the Southern Railway to Selma and along the Alabama and Tallapoosa rivers to Milstead, thence southeast through Eufaula forms a boundary between two nations which have declared war on each other. Red, north, and blue, south. Blue plans call for an immediate employment of her air force against the red air force units located at Tuscaloosa, Birmingham, Anniston, Atlanta, and Columbus, and against the red industrial centers of Birmingham and Atlanta. Reliable reports indicate that red anti-aircraft units are organized to defend Tuscaloosa, Bessemer, Birmingham, Atlanta, and Columbus. War was declared on the 27th of January, and blue attack units destroyed the red airdromes at Columbus, Tuscaloosa, and Atlanta, and were ordered to destroy two recently occupied airdromes at Anniston. Since no coordination with ground troops is involved in this operation, their situation is omitted. The blue first attack group headquarters is located at Bruton. The four squadrons of the first attack group are assigned individual airdromes for additional security between operations. The first attack squadron is at Hammock. The second attack squadron is at Kirkland. The third attack squadron is in the vicinity of Wallace. The fourth attack squadron is in the vicinity of Pollard. Here we see the locations of the four squadrons of the blue first attack group, ready for operations at the time of this problem. The first attack group has been ordered to neutralize the airdromes and destroy the airplanes located thereon at Anniston. Blue observation has located and photographed the two recently prepared red airdromes in the vicinity of Anniston. This is the red airdrome located to the south of Anniston. From this photograph, a sketch has been prepared of the airdrome.
This is the Red Airdrome located to the north of Anniston. Likewise, from this photograph, a sketch has been prepared of the airdrome. The commanding officer of the first attack group plans the attack mission to ensure the neutralization of the red airdromes near Anniston. The wind is from the west with a velocity of 10 miles per hour and making the assault from that direction increases the speed of the attack and aids in the dispersion of chemicals over the objective. As one attack squadron is sufficient to neutralize an airdrome of the size of those near Anniston, the first attack squadron is assigned the mission of attacking the airdrome south of Oxford. The second attack squadron is assigned the mission of attacking the airdrome north of Anniston. A study of the large scale map of the Anniston area indicates that Lincoln will be suitable for a group initial point, being about equally distant from each target. Heflin answers the requirements of a group rally point. Plans for the attack are formulated using the normal attack weapons for operations against airdromes, which are machine guns, parachute type of bombs, and liquid chemical spray. In planning an attack against an airdrome, it is necessary to cover all of the area likely to contain dispersed airplanes. Knowing the area to be covered, the first attack squadron commander finds that Flight A, composed of nine airplanes, can amply cover Area A. Flight B can cover the remaining area marked B placing the attack concentrically upon the area covered by Flight A. Flight A of the first attack squadron approaching from the west will open fire with its forward machine guns as soon as it is in range. Sweeping over the area, it drops its parachute fragmentation and phosphorus bombs in trail, spacing them to cover the entire area, and sprays it with toxic chemicals. As Flight A completes its attack, Flight B approaches from the southwest and opens fire with its forward machine guns. Flight B continues through its assigned area, dropping its parachute bombs and spraying its toxic chemicals covering additional area and reinforcing Flight A's attack.
In order to adequately cover the area over which planes may be dispersed, and because of the shape of the area, the use of three flights of six planes each is adopted by the commander of the second attack squadron. Attacking from the west, he assigns flight A to cover the area marked A. Flight B is assigned to the area B. And flight C is assigned to cover the remaining area marked C. Flight A, attacking from the west, will open fire with its forward machine guns as soon as it comes into range. Then, attacking with bombs and chemical spray, it covers its assigned area. As Flight A uncovers the area, the timing is such that Flight B is in the proper position to open fire. It attacks through its assigned area with parachute bombs and chemical spray. As Flight B uncovers the C area, Flight C has maneuvered into position to open fire with its forward machine guns. It continues the attack using its bombs and chemical spray. Castleberry is selected as the group assembly point. From Castleberry, the group flies in a left echelon of squadrons as shown here. The route is to Burkeville, thence to Talladega Springs, and then to Lincoln the group initial point. From the group initial point at Lincoln, the squadrons separate and proceed toward their assigned targets. Upon arrival in the vicinity of the targets, each squadron commander gives the signal for his squadron to go into its assault formation. This is the squadron initial point. The first attack squadron plans to use two nine-plane flights. Consequently, no change in formation is necessary in the preparation for its attack on the airdrome south of Oxford. The second attack squadron's plans for attacking the airdrome north of Anniston call for three flights of six planes each. And at the squadron initial point, the squadron assumes this formation. The flights carry out their scheme of maneuver in accordance with the plan for the attack. Note how the different flights by circuitous routes arrive at the proper interval in order to coordinate the attacks without appreciably reducing their speed or interfering with one another. The flights rally to again assume the squadron formations and the group formation south of Heflin. The second attack squadron on overtaking the first attack squadron resumes the normal defensive formation and the group assumes the left echelon of squadron formation. The group now proceeds along the route back, picking out navigation points, the first being Lineville. Then Wetumpka, which is prominently located and easily recognized. From there, a direct route is followed until Castleberry is reached, where the two squadrons again separate and go to their respective airdromes. This animated picture has shown the considerations necessary 
in the planning and execution of an assault against hostile air drones. The group commander adhered to the basic principles of employment. The basic principles of employment and how they were followed in this operation are surprise. The attacks were made downwind at minimum altitude and simultaneously against both airdromes. The objective. These airdromes were the most important objectives for attack aviation in support of the Blue Campaign. Mass. One squadron was used against each airdrome, which is adequate force to accomplish the mission. Simplicity. The methods of the attack were simple. Complicated maneuver was avoided. Conservation of force. Two squadrons provided sufficient force and the remaining two squadrons of the group were held for future missions. And security. Security was obtained by the defensive formations flown, the surprise of the attack, the low altitude of the attack, and the rapid rally of the squadrons. Perhaps what is most important is the security for the blue forces, which was provided by destruction of the enemy's means of striking them a blow from the air. The following are actual bombing scenes of a squadron of airplanes on a simulated airdrome. No attempt was made to disperse these airplanes for defensive purposes. A formation of 18 attack planes in elements of three bombed from 1,000 feet with 100-pound demolition bombs. This test was conducted in November 1930. Damage area of bombs is 100 feet. Craters are 5 feet deep and 20 feet in diameter. Note the damage to the airdrome. Repair of such damage is difficult due to chemical contamination. Airplanes were either destroyed or so damaged as to require complete overhaul. Decontamination and leveling of bomb craters on the airdrome will require considerable time and labor. The airdrome would be unusable for about 24 hours. <laughs> 